Hello and welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. I'm Kane Power. There are so many elements to music production that creating and releasing music can seem like completing a puzzle. It can be hard to know which pieces go where and in what order things need to be done. If you don't have any knowledge of or training with the technical aspects of making music, terms like tracking, mixing and mastering can be confusing when you just want to get your songs out there. Let's say you've got a recording you're proud of and you want to share it with the world, but you're not sure if it's up to the expected sonic standard. Your song sounds a little flat and quiet and you're worried it might not compare to other artists in your genre. What do you do? This week, we're talking about mastering. What is it, why do we need it, and can you do it yourself? We're delving into the world of audiophile wizardry to uncover everything you need to know about preparing your tracks for release, and a whole lot more. If you're already familiar with mastering and the ideas behind it, you'll still find value here, as we go into the philosophy behind why mastering engineers exist, and where the craft is heading. To help provide some expert opinion and philosophical guidance, my guest this week is Kevin Tuffy. Kevin is a mastering engineer and audio specialist who has worked in recording, mixing, mastering and audio restoration for more than a decade. More recently, Kevin can be found mastering some of the world's finest artists out of Metropolis Mastering in London. We caught up over Skype. Kev! Welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ken. Let's talk about the world of mastering. Um, we'll keep it kind of basic um, for people just starting out and trying to figure out what mastering is. Um, so maybe we could start with that uh, and sort of start with a sort of a basis for the listeners. What What is mastering okay. from from your kind of professional perspective? Um, so I think it's probably important to understand with mastering where, where it comes from the kind of historical uh, context of, of, of what, like why it was originally done. Um, so, you know, the original mastering engineers were disc cutters. Um, so back then, you know, the, the steps of, of making a record when, you know, your kind of producer who was recording to a maybe like a two-inch tape, 24-track, we get passed on to the mix engineer who would mix maybe from a from a two inch down to a to a quarter inch or a half inch two track, and then really the mastering engineer kind of came in because he or she had a a, a really good understanding of of the the final format of of the disc of the of the vinyl, so they they would have a, a kind of specific expertise set of skill a skill set and and, a, and an understanding about that final format. That maybe the producer or the mix engineer wouldn't really need or, or wouldn't have that that understanding. So I think that's probably where the mastering engineer came from. That's why we exist at all. Um, while the the producer and the the mix engineer are thinking very creatively about how can I make this record just sound really good, the mastering engineer is kind of thinking how can I make this record sound really good, i.e. the actual record, the the format, the the final. Sure. The final thing that's sure. that's that's taking that music to the, the consumer, the listener, and and optimizing that mix essentially, you know, so that when it when it gets to the listener, it works for that format that they're listening in. So I think that's probably where it's kind of come from and where we are today is is that's my world now is that I'm thinking about mastered for iTunes or you know uh, codecs for for compressing stuff for MP3. These are kind of conversations that mastering engineers are having mm. about how we can get the most out of of that and and you know make sure that 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 mix that we get you know that's that's what comes to us the one we pass it on and it's going into consumer world getting either bought or streamed or, or listened to that it, it fits that you know that format and it sounds great. So I think that's that's probably without getting into the kind of geeky nitty gritty of what that entails and how you do that, that is why the mastering engineer exists and that's why they continue to exist and that's why they're important. So Yeah. Can you give us an overall um, summary of maybe some of the technical processes that um, mastering accomplishes or that you, that you undergo during mastering to, to make a track adhere to those um, standards that you're talking about? A really important part of the mastering process is just on a really basic level, it's just like the volume. You know, if you've got 
three or four mix engineers working across a record and they're all kind of hitting different uh, volumes with their mixes that the mastering engineer has to take all of those mixes together and uh, and make them work together within the context of the record so that you know track one going into track two doesn't suddenly dip six db um, with with the older stuff with vinyl there's there's physical because it's a physical format there's physical limitations of vinyl so you know with with newer formats with Spotify and stuff these kind of things there aren't physical limitations it's a digital file it's going to end up a digital file that's going to go on a big server and the the you know the people who log in and have accounts and listen to stuff um that we're, we're thinking in those terms now so we're kind of thinking how do I want to deliver my master so that when it goes through the process of of, of being compressed down you know in the, the kind of mp3 process what little kind of tricks can we do so that the degradation, you know, there is some degradation. The, the, those codecs sound really great, and, and people are are doing these at higher resolutions and stuff now. As the technology changes, it's getting better. But there's still little things that we can do that we can listen to, and we have tools to kind of make sure that, hey, you know, when this becomes an MP3, I still want it to sound as close to the the WAV file, the, the high res file that I delivered. Yeah. So we have little tricks like this. So this this is kind of what what occupies the mastering engineer's mind, um, you know, as well as like EQing, which I'm sure we'll get onto talking about. But just on the most kind of base level, this is why we exist. This is what we're trying to do. Yeah. And then maybe yeah. we'll use some of these tools, these EQ tools, and compression and limiting to get those, you know, to achieve those things where it gets to the, the final product. Let's actually talk about that stuff right now. So say say I send you a track, let's say a good home studio recording, um, and okay. and say, can you please master my track, Kev? Um, what, what, what's the kind of, uh, just a really basic outline of the sort of things that you would do, um, I'm intending just to release it on Spotify. Okay, so the first thing I'm probably going to look out for is the overall volume of the track and and obviously we're in digital world so you might have sent me something that that you know the highest peak is zero dbfs so as far as you're concerned you know that's the loudest it can be and and you know there's some truth in that <laughs> uh, from a certain perspective but you know say spotify i listen to spotify I'll, I'll have it on my phone you know when i'm on the tube and stuff the first consideration i want to make is if, if your home recording is going on and it's going to be next to a whole bunch of other records that are out, New Music, Music Friday or whatever, that I don't want everyone to flick through all the New Music Friday and get to your track and then suddenly it's like pff, huge dip and it's way quieter. Someone's sitting on the train, they can't even hear the song because it's the, the train volume is louder than the volume kicking out of their, their iPhone or, uh, or Android or whatever. So, so straight away I'm going to think about volume and how I can achieve that the most obvious tool in my arsenal is, is going to be a limiter or possibly a couple of limiters. So that's, I'm going to be kind of achieving the, the volume thing with that. The The next thing that's going to come into consideration if it's a home recording is that you might have mixed it on some pretty good speakers in a room that you know really well, but there's going to be probably some elements of that room where there's there's funny nodes there's funny little dips there's certain frequencies that you you don't kind of pick up in that room just because it's not been built by scientists to be you know clinically yeah. flat yeah. and even with a professional studio you'll have people producers mixers moving around from maybe country to country they might go to where the band are they might go to where the artists are they, you know the producer might say this band feel really comfortable in their home studio, so I'm going to go record with them there because that's where we're going to get the best vibe for the record. But that producer's maybe only going to do that one record there. So even if they're the best producer, they're now working in an environment that they're not familiar with. Your mastering guy is probably going to have been sitting in that room for you know anywhere from a couple to 20 to 30 years. Mm. They'll know that room intimately. So any kind of little thing that the mixer or the producer has missed... You, that's you know your mastering engineer is your quality control this is your last check he's going to go he or she is going to go ah that's cool you've missed that one little thing i'm just going to tidy that up it's all going to sound great so so that's kind of why we exist and what and what we do and yeah like i said the limiting with the the volume thing is, is probably the first thing we're looking for mm. any eq things we're going to have some pretty precision eqs you know that's either in the box or on the board 
EQs that kind of can really deal with the the very lows, the very highs, um, and be able to clean up any of those things that we hear that that need to be leveled out. And and then yeah, and then we send the master master back, and everybody involved in the project gets to hear that final thing, and then it gets shipped off for for. Uh, production i suppose yeah, i don't want to say production because distribution you know yeah, like yeah. the actual producing the final the final thing whether that is someone clicking a button to upload it to spotify <laughs> uh or whether it's it's you know burning up a whole load of cds that's kind of that's what that's where we kind of come in and that's what we're doing yeah well okay well so you've um you mentioned the mix engineer and the mix process and the production process obviously you know that that process um has a huge part in determining how the final track will sound. Um, and, you know, once you get a track, there's only a certain amount you can do to it. Um, but let's backtrack a bit and kind of highlight the difference between um, mixing a track and mastering a track. So the the mix engineer, the, 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 the source audio that they work from is, is a multi-track. So they've got uh, free reign to control the levels, the EQ, the compression, all of these things. We're using the same tools, but they're doing it to a bass drum, an 808, a, a hi-hat, a, a, a lead vocal, a backing vocal. By the time it comes to us, it's already, it's already in the stereo world. So I'm kind of reticent to say this, but because, you know, we obviously we can't alter someone, send me a, rec- a track and go, I think the vocal needs to be louder. Well, I, I can't do that. That's, that's the mix engineer. Sometimes you use an EQ or a compressor and it can give the impression that the vocal is louder. So... I suppose there's a little bit of ambiguity there, but generally, you know, I'm I'm working from a two track, so all of those decisions um, have been made, and all of those those sonic uh, qualities of the track now have been determined. Mm. And what I'm doing is is much broader, but brush strokes. If the producer's kind of cutting up all bits of wood, he's going to give them onto the the mix engineer. And the mix engineer is going to assemble those bits of wood into a table. Uh, by the time it gets to me, it's already a table, so I can polish it, but the legs are where they are <laughs> and, the, and the tabletop's where it is. If sure. one of the legs is a bit short and it's kind of, you know, rocking back and forth, I've only got some sandpaper and, and, and some polish, so, you know, that, that I can't really do. I'm just going to, at the very most, I'm going to stick a, a beer mat under one of those legs and hope that it kind <laughs> of stays stable. So, yeah. But, you know, on the, on the flip side as well, a mastering engineer, I guess, most of the time you're getting a, a, a track that's been mixed you know the management the A&R the artist the producer all of these people have signed it off they're all happy with it otherwise it wouldn't have made it as far as me so I'm kind of of the belief that the mastering engineer shouldn't kind of alter the fundamentals of the track you're just there to enhance what's already great about it and you don't want to kind of send back a master that suddenly sounds the, the you know the biggest thing is always going to be Maybe the volume jump. Some some mix engineers mix pretty pretty close to the to the end stop, and they mix pretty hot. So even that you're not going to change much. But some guys mix with you know six, sometimes twelve dB of headroom. So the the, the really obvious thing that's going to pop out is that it's suddenly louder. Um, but the other things are going to be subtler. But hopefully, like you know, that's what you want to do. You want to improve it. You don't want to you don't want to fuck it up. So uh, yeah. so yeah, you you know, it could be a bit brighter. It could be a little bit bassier it could be a bit punchier but you know you're you're in the kind of it's why we call it the dark art you're in the kind of ambiguous adjectives with regards to uh to what we're doing whereas a mix engineer if you're not happy with the mix you're going to be saying like that kick drum needs to come up that vocal needs to go down you know it it all needs to sound more distorted these are much bigger more noticeable changes that the mix engineer is making the mastering engineer is a subtler kind of discipline i think yeah yeah totally what about um, for our listeners who may be thinking, um, can I master my own tracks? Do I need to send my my tracks to a mastering engineer? Um, you know, I've I've recorded them. I've I've kind of done the best sort of mix I can. I'm really happy with how it sounds. Can I do it myself? It can be done, um, and and obviously you should try to make whatever piece of music sound as good as possible with the resources available. I think what you the benefits you get from having different people being like maybe the songwriter, maybe the producer, maybe the mixer, and then the mastering engineer is that you have more ears listening to that 
eventually that record's going to get listened, you know, you would hope as, as the, the, the creator of that music by as many years as possible. Mm. So it's better to have five sets of ears, make sure that you've kind of got everything right before it goes out to the big wide world than one set of ears. Because then when it suddenly gets listened to by a million people and, you know, these little blemishes and mistakes that are maybe in there, two years later I hear this from mix engineers I mean I've done this with stuff that I mastered years ago that I've gone back and gone oh man I could have done that better now you know uh if you don't have those ears on it the more ears you get on it before it's out in the big wide world the more confident you can be that you've got it as 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 best as you you know possibly can so I think that's where the the benefits come from Mm. if if there is no budget I think and and you just want to you know this is something you just really want to get out there reference as much as possible especially within the kind of sonic palette of 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 what you're doing get your get your mix right and and do all that bit leave yourself a little bit of headroom maybe i don't know if if someone's working in like pro tools or logic or, or ableton but get that down to two track get it get it how you like it you know so that you've self approved the mix then get it into maybe a new session and pull in a couple of tracks so that you can reference them for volume, for for you know overall, uh, for how punchy it is, for how how warm it is, bright, that the bottom end, that the kind of levels of the kick are right, and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, if if, if you're already doing this, if you're home recording or you're home mixing, you're going to have some, presumably some plugins that do this. You're going to have limiters. You're going to have compressors, maybe multiband compressors and EQs, and then you can start to utilize those and, and manipulate them and try and kind of reference some other stuff and then when it's it's as close to where you want it to be and then that's that's your master you know you, you whoever is is the mastering engineer in that moment you know just because someone you know says it on your at the end of your email that you're a mastering engineer you know anyone can do it but like i say i think there's a, a massive benefit to having that collaborative uh, workflow but sometimes I understand as well that there's that that's not always possible depending on the project. So yeah. So I think people can be their own mastering engineers, but you 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 know you kind of you would get someone else to do it. Just like anything, uh, if you want it the best possible, you you want someone with that experience. You're paying them for their experience and their ear and their and their tools and yeah. And it comes down to um, how you're trying to represent yourself to the market and how you're trying to put across your sound. Like it, how many times do you do the cheaper option? You know. Do you record at home and then do you mix at home and then do you master at home and your track has cost you a sum total of zero dollars, but maybe it doesn't sound as good as if you'd done it in a studio with a real mix engineer and then sent it to a real mastering engineer. Um, I can definitely support the uh, multiple ears um, argument. Um, I mean, on I've, I've mastered a couple of records that I've done um, on my own, you know, it's records that I've made, I have mastered a couple of them. Um, and they're never, they're never as good as when I send it, <laughs> as when I send it to someone else. Firstly, because I'm not really a mastering engineer. Um, but secondly, because you're, you're close to the project. And so I mix it how I think it should sound. And then I master it and I kind of go, oh, well, it kind of just needs to be a bit louder and a bit wider and a bit brighter. And hey, there we are, you know. But what what I've done in the past is, on some recordings um, that I've spent a lot of time with, I've written the music, I've recorded it, and I've mixed it. I'll send it to a mastering engineer, and then and then I'll master it myself, and then I'll listen to what the mastering engineer gives me. And I've you know always planning on paying the mastering engineer for their work, um, regardless of you know of of what, which one I choose. But you know what? I've never ever chosen my own. It's always been beneficial to have an, a professional another set of ears checking out my mixes if, if you are going to go down that road the best possible thing you could do to get the best result on, on a shoestring is try and mix it and master it if you can't you know if you can get into someone else's studio do it in a different studio you want to hear it you need it's that difference of opinion and it's that objective uh i know what you're saying about being too close to something you know that that does happen and uh and you know, <laughs> there's not really much you can do about that. But maybe like, don't then master it in the same place that you mix it because you're just going to hear it exactly as you heard it while you were mixing. Yeah. And if possible, leave a gap as well. You know, maybe mix everything, get to the point, and then you know the track that you mixed 
two weeks ago, when you sit down with it again, your ears, because your ears will hear stuff how you want it to sound sometimes, and you're not actually hearing it exactly as it is. What about, now, everyone that's listening who's considering getting their stuff mastered um, will, will have seen this, and I've seen it, and you've seen it. What about the sites that offer online mastering, you know, for... Twenty dollars a song, or something, something like that. You know, like like cheap online mastering. Sent, you know, get your tracks sounding like the pros, kind of thing. Have you got any experience with them? Are they legit? Well, it, it kind of depends because I know that the, there's some really big uh, mastering house. I mean, the, the mastering house that I that I work at offers online mastering. You know, your Abbey Roads and all this kind of stuff. If, if, if you're sending it to Abbey Road and, and maybe you're getting an assistant or, or someone like that, the, the likelihood is that they're going to be using that same equipment. They're going to be listening to it on monitors. So you're getting a lot of the stuff that you would want from your mastering sort of uh, session, you're still going to get. Maybe you can't attend. You probably can't attend, not for $20 a track. No. But um, no. So there's certain things that you're going to lose out on attending, picking the engineer, um, maybe getting that same kind of dialogue where you can sort of talk them through the process and, and have revisions and all that kind of stuff. So there is a chance that you're going to send it, get it back and not like what they've done and maybe it's not going to work out. But I would say it's still be- it's still a better option than, than not mastering at all. And then, like I say, if you have got the budget, if you can go to a, an engineer that you know and trust, if you can a- maybe attend the session... Um, the really good thing about mastering is, uh, w- with the kind of mastering rooms, is that because the, the monitoring is so flat and so trustworthy, that's what we like at our studio, is that there's that collaborative um, potential to have the client come in and what they're hearing and what everybody in that room is hearing, sometimes the A&R will come in, sometimes the manager, we're all kind of hearing the tr- the true representation of that song there's not gonna be like a huge bump at 1k in the monitoring that's gonna you know make it sound completely different Mm. not to say that it won't then sound different when you take away in the car or whatever because you know a car doesn't sound like a giant set of pmcs but um that's kind of what's good about the mastering is if you can attend uh then you can you can be there and hear it as it is and go that's how I want the record to sound. This is cool. I can sign this off right now, and that's I'm happy for that to go to the manufacturing plant or go up on Spotify. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So the, the, you're going to lose benefits by using those those online stuff. I mean, some of them may be a little bit kind of like a scam, like you don't even know what the studio is. Um, but if you send it once and you're you know you can spend twenty dollars that one time and it comes back and you're happy, then maybe you've got you know, a, a resource that you can start using and going, well, I'll send it there. It's a different set of ears. It's a different set of monitors. It's somebody else's opinion. It's somebody else's take. And you kind of get quite a lot of the stuff from the mastering process that, you, that you're after. So, yeah, so, so yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think they're okay. But maybe look into um, Metropolis or something for, for their online mastering um, rather than online mastering for you.com. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe. Like, well, maybe. I mean, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, okay. So, what about if what about if someone wanted to, they can't afford to get their tracks mastered? They're going to do it themselves. Um, what What do you need, and what sort of resources do you need to to learn to do it? I mean, I'm kind of a big proponent of the the like 10,000 hours thing. I think just doing it loads over and over again on lots of different stuff um, is is a good thing to do. Anyone who's kind of doing that is probably going to start off in the plugin world. I mean, the plugins, I kind of am always amazed at how much they improve um, all the time. And, and some of the stuff that's coming out now, it's just absolutely mind blowing. So you can, there's some really affordable stuff out there. That's some of the UAD D stuff. I know it's probably a bit more expensive, but you know, for, if you get them on sale and stuff, there's some really great plugins that you can maybe get for less than, I'm, I'm sort of talking in pounds cause I'm in the UK, but for less than a hundred pounds mm. for some like mm. really mind blowing plugins that I find myself turning to every single day. So you kind of want to, read the reviews, go on the, the sort of chat rooms and, and, and listen to mastering engineers and, and, and find out who's using what. Um, and I think you'll find quite a lot of consensus on some stuff. And I, like I say, I think just doing it over and over again, 
constantly referencing records. If you hear a record that you like the way it sounds, and, and hopefully you like the record too, the, the, the artistry, but if you hear that, constantly referencing that and going, okay, why doesn't Mark, what's missing from this that I'm doing that doesn't sound like that? And keep experimenting and you'll find that over time you get closer and closer to that great record that you think sounds amazing your records are getting closer to sounding like that great record so yeah i would agree as well um you know you can you can look at some youtube tutorials and maybe look at some ebooks or some books or something um but i think in the end it's about referencing what you're doing to what you're hearing in the wider marketplace um because that's what people are listening to that's what the accepted kind of standard is referencing is extremely important and and doing it over and over again until you kind of understand what you're hearing and what you're doing and it's just that you know that level of experiment that you know experimenting a lot and changing stuff and 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 trying to listen critically and, and training your ear and when i say training your ear it's not like there's a rocky montage and you're running along a beach with boxing gloves and stuff but just listening and going okay if the attack's slower how does that sound how is that affecting the sound how's it affecting the bottom end how's it affecting the top end and you know that's where you get into the kind of multi-band compression world of setting different attacks and release times at different frequencies and how do they respond and you know how does that affect the, the balance of the mix how is that opening up the the bottom end or, or does the bottom end now sound like much more closed and, and claustrophobic and and doing that at all the different bands and uh, so I think, yeah, just, just kind of doing that and listening to what you're doing and kind of stupid stuff. I mean, obviously what you're saying about uh, YouTube tutorials and, and books and, and also if you get to sit in with like a, an engineer and, and learn from them or, or you get into a, a, a position where you're, where you're in that world, then that's a, that's a huge thing as well. You can learn so much in, in so little time. But if, if you are restricted from, from some of those, yeah, just going around and listening critically to each of those things and, and kind of trying to, you know, think about how, how does this sound? How has this changed the sound? Do I like it? Do I not like it? And really think about those things and, and it'll doing it over and over again. And that repetition, you'll start to find yourself like moving towards certain things and some things will start coming automatically and you'll, you'll know that setting something in a specific way will give you that sound that you that you crave that you want it to sound like that and and then yeah. the records will start sounding really good so yeah it's it's a process but and it, and you there's no overnight way to do it but the more you do it and uh, it just keeps making more and more sense yeah. but yeah you want to get the yeah, basics cool. right first totally and okay say we have got the basics right say uh, we've you know recorded a track we've mixed it um and we're preparing to master it um, what are the kind of basic requirements in terms of sample rate and bit rate that people need to think about? Firstly, maybe for those who have no idea what those mean, um, maybe we could get a really simple, uh, easy to understand description of, of rates um, and, and kind of what, the, what they mean and why we should be concerned with them. If you kind of think of, of digital captures of sound, um, almost like an XY graph, so yeah, so the sample rate is, is I guess, uh, your x-axis is how many snapshots per second you're taking of that sound wave. The more snapshots we take per second of that sound wave, the more fidelity with which we can recreate it in the digital realm. And then the, the bit depth is going along the y-axis, so it's the amplitude, it's, it's the, the loudness. A, a, a zero dB sound is the, the loudest sound that you can get in 16 bit is still as loud as it is in 24 bit but the uh, resolution at which you can read the dynamic of those sounds so the, the the difference between the loudest and the quietest you can do it at a greater detail the higher the bit depth you use so the 16 bit was the CD standard and then 24 bit is kind of I suppose the standard at the moment but more and more, certainly mix engineers are sending me stuff that's that's 32 floating, 32 bit floating point now. So that's a higher resolution. It means we've got much more scope for the dynamics. The 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 difference between that loudest and the quietest sound 
all of the steps in between and the notches in between, the, the, the levels at which you can record stuff and reproduce them, there's a lot more detail there now. And, mm -hmm. and, and the more detail and both ways with the sample rate and with the, the bit depth means that there's a much richer palette at which we can reproduce sound in the in the digital realm and they will sound fuller and, 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 and more dynamic and, and more rich. So there are arguments to be made. I think if you're like maybe doing an orchestral recording where you've got all these uh, organic sounds in, the, in a beautiful room, you're going to want to do stuff really high res. You're going to want to do stuff at a really high sample rate. And, uh, and also because the consumers of that audio are more likely to have a really top spec hi-fi they might be listening in quite a quiet listening environment where they can feel the full effects of those of all that dynamic richness and all and all of the uh the hot the kind of high sample rates but at the same time sometimes you know people get really hung up on doing everything say at 96k and 24 bit or 96k and 32 bit doing stuff as high res as possible but if the music is largely built on samples and those samples were only ever recorded at 44.1, 16-bit, you know, by up-sampling and up resing those, those sounds, you're not going to add anything to them. If it's already digital, you can make all that extra gigabytes of, of, of digital audio and WAVs on your, on your hard drive and slow your computer down with it, but it's, you're not really adding anything. And the same if the performance and the, the aesthetic of that record necessitates that the vocal needs to be super compressed and no dynamics at all and really distorted and it just needs to sound like that, like a punk record or a, maybe like a grime record where it just needs that aggressive sound. Then doing that kind of stuff at really high bit depth, the bit depth is there to capture dynamics and if, if really nuanced dynamics aren't part of that record, I don't think we need to get too hung up on, you know, 96k 24 bit or 96k 32 bit versions of those records the technology and everything that we do in the studio should fit first and foremost the compositions and and the aesthetic of that that is a piece of art at the end of the, the day and that needs to be the most important thing and it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about budget stuff i know that we live in the real world and budgets matter but sometimes recording at home and if you've got a couple of mics kicking around and you've got a computer and, a, and a, a, an A to D where you can plug stuff in, that might be the perfect thing for that record. And you might have $100,000 sitting there where you could, you could book a studio out, you could have loads of session musicians and you could have the best producer around, but there's not really any such thing as the best producer. The, the, only, the best producer is whoever's right for that record. So maybe that record is supposed to be recorded in a living room with three instruments. Maybe those songs will sound the best it done that way and maybe not mastering it with a fancy mastering engineer or mixing it with a fancy mix engineer. And then on the flip side, maybe there's another song that it needs it needs to be that really polished kind of everything needs to be recorded perfectly and everything needs to be really big budget, high production sound, really glossy. It, it just depends on the, on the song. It's, it's so important that none of us in the chain from you know the manager the a&r the mastering guy the mixer the producer everybody is on it understands that piece of art and wants to make it sound like it's supposed to be and and it fulfills the kind of the artist's you know vision of what they wanted to do i think that's that's really important as well so what's the what's the minimum what what do we upload our music as i mean everyone's you know working in mp3 um for putting their stuff online is you know can we do it in 48k 24 but does it need to be 44.116 um do our mp3s need to be 320 um what's the kind of when, when we've got a song and we've got our master like what's the sort of minimum requirements to get it onto places like soundcloud and spotify and itunes I would say if you're delivering to a mastering engineer, do like kind of the reverse of what I've just said, but do always try and give them 24 bit at least um, just because they've probably got a better way of dithering stuff than you do. And if, you know, if you have recorded it at 16 bit and you didn't think about it at the time and that's what you did, then so be it. It's 16 bit. Don't then up res it because there's no point. But um, I'm finding I'm delivering everything at the moment at 44.1, uh, 24 bit as like a kind of minimum. 
Um, for CDs, we've got to get down to 16 bits. So we'll do the down to 16 bit because that's a limitation of the format. And, and you know, we have to make sure it sounds. Going back to the, the one of the very first things I said about making sure it's right for the format. So we're going to get stuff right for CD. It's going to be 44.116. Ultimately, all of these sort of sample rates, they're all going to end up as this MP3, right? Which is going to be if not an exact file size, it's going to be like a, a KBPS rate. But ultimately, the, the the piece of audio that's going out on the platform afterwards that people are listening to is going to end up as the same, you know, file. It's like you don't make an MP3 out of a 96, 24-bit WAV and suddenly it's like this huge MP3 and you kind of have tricked all the people at the platform. It's, it's always going to end up as, as this, this final um, file. So... I think there's some important stuff there, but I think the, the things you really want to nail and get right are less to do with tech spec and just making sure it sounds as good as possible. Just making sure that the, the, the production and the mix and master job that you, you, know, you or whoever's involved in the project, that they're all happy and that they think that sounds really awesome because that's, that's the main thing. I mean... We've done some tests at the studio where we've listened to different platforms because it's crazy. I mean, there is differences. Like, mm. there's a, an album that I did recently. I listened to that on Spotify and I listened to it on Apple Music and it sounds different. And that's weird for me as a mastering engineer because I'm normally used to delivering the thing. You know, if I make the CD, every CD is going to be made from that CD. It's ones and zeros. It's never going to sound different. So there's a real weird thing where you're delivering... Like I say, I'm delivering these kind of 44.1, possibly higher sample rate, but 24-bit WAV. It goes off through some production team. The turnaround is a lot quicker because there's no physical thing to make. So, so I might deliver that on a Tuesday and then, you know, I click on to open my Spotify app on, on Friday, click on new releases and that track is, is up there. And I click on that and it, it doesn't, I mean, I'm expecting it's not going to sound the same because I know it's going to be MP3. So I, I already have that expectation, but I can load up three different platforms and I can click through them and they, they all sound slightly different. I mean, I'm not talking about huge, you know, really noticeable. Also, there's a there's a certain element um, from, from what you're saying. I think that's really interesting. And now I'm keen to go and listen to music across different platforms to see if I can spot the difference. Um, but I think... Most people probably won't. Your average consumer probably won't hear the difference from that. You will because it's your job. <laughs> you know, it's your job to hear it and your ears are trained to listen to that. Um, and I think when there is a difference, maybe it is affecting listeners in slightly different ways. Um, maybe more people are, you know, favor a certain sound for a certain platform. It, you know, it might end up that way. I think it's really interesting. I think that's an entirely a whole nother wormhole um, that we could get into. That's another pod. <laughs> That's another podcast, man. That definitely is. But what I, what I want to finish with um, for our conversation is, is about loudness. Um, now, often, often when I'm seeing um, amateur tracks posted up, um, people asking for critiques, they're saying, um, is it loud enough? Or, you know, am, have I gone too loud? Or what's the, they're not really sure what they should be doing. Um, and we talked before about referencing other tracks to kind of get your, you know, to, to get your reference point uh, on how loud and how, how your track should sound, but how loud should, should we really be pushing it, um, before it kind of creeps into the realm of distortion and uncomfortable listening? I, I mean, I'm not one of these engineers who thinks that, that loudness is the be all and end all. And I, I you know, while I think you, you kind of can't put records out that are super quiet for, for reasons that I've mentioned already, and the same strength, I think loudness for loudness sake is is crazy. And, and, and the whole loudness war that happened in the 90s, I think originally probably had a detrimental effect on the records we listened to. But actually, I'm, I'm, I think two things have come into play. And one is that I think some of that is getting rolled back now and that there's a little bit of a, a kind of counter revolution against that. And, and people are less... Um, kind of caught up and, and, and obsessed with that. And I think the other thing that's happened is that music has has sort of changed to sort of sound good loud. The sound of kind of limiters working quite hard and stuff stuff being quite punchy and, and, and maybe not as dynamic has become quite in vogue. And, and there's a lot of records, uh, there's some really loud records like Kanye West records and stuff are super 
loud. <laughs> but there's decisions that were made earlier on in the makings of those records that mean that they can sound both loud and good at the same time. So what's kind of happened with the loudness war is that actually we found ways, rather than taking a song that we made not thinking about this stuff and throwing loads of limiters on it and making it as loud as possible, as happened during the loudness wars, people rethought about how to compose music using timbres and instruments and sounds where they could make stuff limited and loud, but it would still sound good and it wouldn't sound like horrible that it was so over compressed. So there's a really interesting kind of, uh, but like interplay that happened, I guess, with production. I mean, you listen to any record at the moment, there's almost certainly, or a sort of pop record, like really popular pop record, it's probably like trap hats going on. Trap hats, you can get to sort of sound loud and, and sort of exciting and fizzy in a record. And it's easy to make those sound loud and you can compress them forever and they'll never sound compressed because it's such a, a stunted, um, there's no sustain to that sound, you know, that's the kind of whole joy of them is that they're maybe playing like hemi semi demi quavers and that they're doing that and there's no sustain to it so you can just get the transient really loud and then the, the sound dies away so that kind of stuff is super easy to get loud without it sounding over compressed. So these sounds that we now have all over records are really transient heavy it's all like the transient is the main part of the sound so that's like the beginning kind of click sound mm. it's that's kind of I, that's really interesting and I, I find that kind of interesting the way in which the interplay between what happened with the loudness war and what people expected and how producers and songwriters changed the, their process so that they could get stuff to sound both loud as was the kind of fashion but also good and not like terrible because it's loud. Um, with how loud people should make their records, um, like I say, I think as loud as, as, as like you said, as comfortable, like nobody wants unwarranted distortion in, in, in a record. Obviously, if you, you know, you're making a punk rock record and you want to distort a guitar, then go for it. But if, if you're compressing and limiting stuff to the point that they're breaking up and, and that it doesn't sound good, then you've probably gone too far or the, the other settings on that compressor or limiter aren't, aren't responding properly to, and there, there are tricks you can do, attacks, releases and stuff that will make that sound better. Um, I, as a general rule, I mean, everything that I'm probably putting out is, is going to be hitting the zero end stop, the loudest point is anyway, that's for sure. Um, as a kind of general rule, a lot of the stuff that I'll do is uh, just as a starting point, I'll kind of aim between minus eight and minus 10 uh, dBRMS, which is like your sort of perceived loudness, just to kind of have some consistency. Um, some stuff maybe won't get that loud without sounding kind of horrible. I'll never uh, compromise sound over loudness. So if I can get something to be as loud as possible and it still sounds great and it doesn't sound like it's kind of falling apart and horrible, then I'll do it. It's great. I think that's a good thing because if, if you can't hear it working and it, you're getting a really loud record, that's great. But once I can start to hear that compromise creep in, that's where I'll, where I'll stop. So yeah, there's no real right answer, but I think wherever you can get it to be the loudest it can be is good because if your record's really quiet, it's not going to stand out next to others, but it's not, it's not essential. Um, and you definitely should never compromise sound quality for just for the sake of loudness because that's what happened with the loudness war and what were some incredibly well composed and well mixed records ended up not being as nice and, and maybe we'll see like a bit of a remastering job done on those because like I said I think there's a counter revolution now and people aren't as uh, obsessed with it as they once were and, and there seems to be a conversation now about sound quality and dynamics and and all the wonderful things that they can bring too. So um, yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah, we're, yeah. we're moving the other way. Kev, uh, I'm going to throw something on you um, before we wrap up that I haven't mentioned, um, and it's probably a complete surprise. Um, I have a an artist of the week or a band of the week that I do every week, um, and okay. it's a segment that uh, I encourage my guests to uh, contribute to. So... Off the top of your head, who have you been listening to in the last few weeks or months um, that you would like to put forward as, as our band or artist of the week? Uh, I, I think 
Her name is Phoebe Bridges. She's a, a kind of American, I, I don't want to say, I don't know if I should say country singer. It's, it's, it's kind of country influence. I guess she's more like indie rock. Um, and I think her record is called Stranger in the Alps. And that came out about two weeks ago. And I've been listening to that a lot. So if I can put that one forward, then that's, that's what I'm going to go with. Nice one. Hey, Kev, thank you so much, mate. Really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Kane. It was great speaking to you. And that's the podcast for this week. Thank you so much to my guest, Kevin Tuffy. You can find out more about Kevin and check out his work at metropolismastering.com. This podcast and my site, musiciansmap.org, is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about honesty and positive progress. My experience and the experience and advice of my guests is yours to learn from. There are no hidden meanings, ambiguous statements, or industry secrets, just people helping each other to achieve results. Much of my experience, advice, and information is condensed into both ebook and audiobook form, both of which are available on the site as well as on Amazon and Audible, respectively. In the book, I discuss every aspect of learning music from listening and learning an instrument to recording, gigging, touring, and making money as a musician. For those of you who want to get serious or are looking for more immediate results, I offer one-on-one development sessions and song critiques. These are intensely focused super sessions designed to provide clarity and purpose to achieving your goals. I've also got a ton of free stuff, including a free five-step challenge, free cheat sheets and checklists of all kinds, articles and videos, so head to musiciansmap.org to take advantage of all of the resources on offer. Make sure to get in touch with your comments and suggestions and let me know what challenges you are facing at the moment over at the Musicians Map Facebook group. I always respond. Thanks for listening and stay positive. Stay positive.